Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! One change we're going to have to acclimatise ourselves to uh, is that we'll be seeing less of George Osborne. Six years in the Treasury and a very turbulent six years at that. We heard earlier about the difficult conversation he'd had with uh, Theresa May when she sacked him. David Grossman has been taking a look at his legacy. So the high-vis Chancellor fades, for now at least, from the political scene, hanging up his fluorescent jacket and hard hat. But we can at least see what Mr Osborne has built and compare it to the plans he submitted when he started the job. The primary task that George Osborne set for himself was eliminating the structural deficit by 2015. Here was the plan reduction from his first budget. But this is what he actually achieved. Still a long way to go. Indeed, after the Brexit referendum, both Mr Osborne and the soon-to-be new Prime Minister abandoned the already postponed target. The reason for the failure to get the deficit down as much as he hoped isn't because he tried to implement tax rises or benefit cuts or public service cuts and they didn't happen. The measures he announced did happen. It's because the economy didn't grow as strongly as he thought and that meant that tax revenues kept disappointing. But, and it's a big but, Mr Osborne gets credit from many economists for absorbing the political embarrassment of repeatedly missing his targets rather than reducing government spending even further to try to meet them. I think the biggest criticism to me on the macro side is that all the adjustment in the fiscal position was on spending. He slashed spending dramatically and I think that's one of the reasons we see so many unhappy people. Local government spending, for example, has really been cut dramatically and that's a very controversial job. George Osborne's second objective was under the extremely broad category of rebalancing the economy. For a start, this meant moving the country away from a reliance on the financial sector that left us so exposed after the crash and towards more manufacturing. Obviously, one of the, the big tenets was this sort of the march of the makers and, and to have more rebalancing towards manufacturing. And I think actually uh, the makers would like to see a bit more spring in their step than they have uh, at the moment. I think they still see quite a lot of challenges uh, ahead. But I think where you can uh, see some things the Chancellor did do to sort of help manufacturing was a real focus on uh, research and development, on innovation. Rebalancing the economy also meant reducing the ratio of household debt to income and increasing savings. But this proved impossible in an era of ultra-low interest rates, which discouraged saving and encouraged borrowing. Households are choosing to spend a lot relative to their income, so the household saving ratio is at a very low level by historical standards. And the amount of borrowing, how we financing all this borrowing, well, the amount of borrowing we do from overseas is at extremely high levels relative to history. So we're a country in which the household sector is borrowing a lot of money. The government is still borrowing a lot, not as much as it did. And that borrowing is being financed a lot by overseas um, lending. The third objective we can measure Mr Osborne against is his ambition to spread growth beyond London and the southeast of England. As a Cheshire MP, the Chancellor championed the so-called Northern Powerhouse. This was partly about infrastructure, but partly about political reform to devolve power. I think it has, but I think there's a lot more to be done. And I think what he did was sort of highlight some of the issues and to start in train some of the devolution uh, of powers and to have more uh, power to local mayors, etc. But I think what uh, people would say is we need to see more connections between Sheffield, Manchester, Leeds, some of our, our northern cities, but also in, in the Midlands between Nottingham and Leicester. Uh, and I think sort of focusing on, on the transport infrastructure between some of the UK's bigger cities uh, undoubtedly need to be the, the focus of policy going forward. We've got a dual economy, London and the South East, few other metropolitan areas are dominant, much of the country is really not doing very well and again that's been shown in the Brexit vote. So he hasn't rebalanced the economy in a strange ironical way maybe Brexit will do that but basically by, by battering London. Indeed like his friend David Cameron perhaps Mr Osborne's entire time in office will come to be defined by that referendum result. If Brexit does result 
in economic calamity as he warned, well, Mr Osborne will get blamed for letting it happen. If, on the other hand, Brexit is a roaring success, he will get none of the credit, having argued so vehemently against it. David Grossman there on David, on George Osborne. I've been getting